Hello everyone, my name is Luca Fossati and I lead the Exoplanet Research Group at the Space Research Institute of the Austrian Academy of Sciences in Graz. This lecture is about atmospheric escape and it is divided into two different parts. One is uh, dedicated to theory and the other one dedicated to observations. Let's start with the, with the first part, which is uh, theory. So let's start, let's begin with a little bit of nomenclature and how the, the atmosphere, the upper atmosphere is, uh, is structure is defined uh, so that we, we talk the same language during this lecture. Let's start from the top where there is the, exo, uh, the exosphere. The exosphere is the non-collisional part of the atmosphere and uh, where the, the, the particles in the atmosphere are not dominated, the gas is not dominated by collisions. So if a particle moves, it can move uh, forever inside the atmosphere, essentially without colliding with uh, any other particle inside, uh, inside the, the exosphere. Then uh, we have the, uh, at, at the bottom of the exosphere, we have the exobase, which is the border between the part that is collisional and non-collisional inside the atmosphere. And um, the, the definition for, for deciding whether a part of the atmosphere is collisional or non-collisional is by comparing the mean free path of neutral particles with the, the pressure scale height. And the exobase is, is where the two quantities, the ratio between the two quantities is about one. And then below we have the, the thermosphere uh, and uh, which uh, at the bottom is defined, uh, at the bottom defines the, the thermobase and which, and the thermosphere lies between the, the exobase and the thermobase. And the thermosphere is where the actual heating of the, in the upper atmosphere happens and the thermobase is located close to the maximum of the temperature. Uh, escape processes are divided into two big categories as, that are called as thermal escape and non-thermal escape. There are three main thermal escape processes that are called genes escape, and this works in the exosphere. Then there is blow off that works mostly in the thermosphere. And then there is boil off that, um, that is driven in the lower atmosphere and in the thermosphere. And there is a large number of non-thermal escape processes that uh, uh, work both in the exosphere and uh, work on actually crust. Let's start with genes escape, which is the, by far the most common atmospheric escape process. Uh, it, it happens always uh, on any body that has uh, a gaseous envelope. Uh, if we have uh, a ball of gas, this gas will have a certain temperature and the, 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 the velocity of the particles inside the gas uh, because of, of the temperature they have are, is, defined, is, is defined by distribution that follows the Maxwellian distribution that is written here. And it is shown here. Now, if we have particles that are at the, uh, at the exobase, close to the, close to the exobase, uh, at the tail of the distribution, there are some particles, a small amount, but there are some that have a very large velocity. And this, this velocity exceeds the planetary escape velocity at the exobase, these particles can escape because at the exobase, the, uh, the, 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 the gas is not collision anymore. So particles can then escape. Uh, one can compute the particle escape flux at the, esco at the exobase, so, so the mass loss rate essentially, and it is defined by this formula that contains the most probable velocity uh, of the gas, so the peak, the velocity corresponding to the peak of the Maxwellian distribution, then the density at the exobase, and this parameter, which is uh, x, which is the genes escape parameter, that is the ratio between the escape velocity divided by the thermal velocity, everything squared. Just a curiosity, at the equator, uh, particularly for fast rotating planets, at the equator, uh, genes escape is stronger than at the poles. Uh, let's look uh, uh, now, let's take a look at the stellar emission because this is important. This is the one that drives the escape. So this is the spectral energy distribution for the sun. Uh, at, uh, at, low ener at high energy, we have the X-rays and extreme ultraviolet that all together are called XUV. Then we have the near and far ultraviolet and then the optical and infrared. In the ultraviolet, the, the, the main features are the Lyman alpha line in the far UV and then the magnesium 2HNK resonance lines and the calcium 2HNK lines in the near ultraviolet and blue part of the optical uh, region respectively. Uh, in the far UV and uh, near UV, this is the, the spectral energy distribution in this, uh, in this range. The far ultraviolet is strongly dominated by the Lyman alpha line, and there are an, uh, other few lines that, that uh, are important in this, uh, in this range. And in the near ultraviolet, uh, the, the key lines are the magnesium 2 HNK resonance lines and the strong magnesium 1 resonance line. This part of the spectrum 
when it in it um, it heats a planetary atmosphere is responsible for metal photoionization and molecular photodissociation. If we move towards the blue uh, and we go at uh, a wavelength shorter than 912 angstrom, which is the uh, corresponds to the hydrogen ionization energy, we are into the XUV uh, regime, into, into the XUV range, which is responsible also for metal photoionization and molecular photodissociation, but also to hydrogen photoionization, which is extremely important for driving the escape. So the, um, this is how it works. Uh, let's take a hydrogen dominated atmosphere. We, um, and let's take a photon that comes at, at, uh, at the, with, with a wavelength precisely of 912 angstrom. What happens is that the, uh, the atom will absorb the photon and the electron will, uh, the energy that he receives is just enough to ionize the atom. So the electron leaves the, the atom and the atom ionizes. And uh, the electron is, however, left with no energy because it has used all the energy that came from the photon to escape from the, from the photon. Now, what happens if uh, uh, a photon comes that has a slightly larger energy? It happens that the energy that has not been used for, that is exceeding and has not been used for ionizing the atom is left inside the electron. And part of this energy goes into heating the atmosphere, mostly through, uh, through collisions. And uh, this is how the XUV energy is transferred into heat into, into planetary atmosphere. One thing that one has to take into account and has to remember is that particularly for stars that are not young, the EUV part of the spectrum is about 10 times stronger than the X-ray part of the spectrum. And uh, only for young stars, the two uh, fluxes are about the same. So if one needs to compute how much heat comes from, from the XUV, one has to account for both EUV and X-ray radiation, not only for the X-ray radiation, as uh, some actually do in the literature. Now, this is the, uh, this plot shows the typical temperature profile as a function of radius for a planet that is uh, in, in a hydrodynamic regime. So it is in, in blow off. So there is a peak in the temperature, which is where the XUV radiation is absorbed. And then the temperature decreases. And this is due to the fact that the atmosphere hydrodynamically expands and this expansion leads to adiabatic cooling. You see also two velocities here. There is the thermal velocity, uh, which is drawn by a solid line. And then there is the, this, uh, the, the hydrodynamic velocity, which is the red dashed line. And the, um, the, these velocities are actually very useful because they allow one to uh, identify where the exobase is. If the total velocity of the gas, the, the total velocity of the gas can never exceed the sound speed in the collisional part of the atmosphere. So where the total speed of the gas uh, equals the sound speed, that's where the exobase lies. Um, there is one term that is very important that is called RXUV, so XUV radius or effective radius. And this is the location where the most of the XUV radiation is absorbed. And it is actually different for the EUV and the X-rays. But since that for most of the stars, the EUV part of the spectrum is stronger than the X-ray, the uh, effective radius is, um, is typically considered to be the one of the EUV uh, absorption. The X-ray uh, absorption radius is slightly deeper than the EUV absorption radius because, um, because X-rays penetrate slightly deeper than, uh, than the EUV radiation. Now, um, the, the top of the atmosphere, uh, the, the maximum temperature in the upper atmosphere is, you, you, you may have noticed that in hot Jupiter is always around, uh, modeled to be around 10,000 Kelvin. There is a specific reason for this, between 10,000, yeah, let's say around uh, 10,000 Kelvin. And there is a very specific reason for this. Let's now, now look at, uh, at the plot on the right-hand side. Uh, you see the temperature profile of the sun in the upper atmosphere. Uh, so in the photosphere and upper atmosphere as a function of altitude. And the inside, so the, the photosphere is on the right and then it moves uh, upwards from right to left. 
So first temperature decreases due to the photosphere, and then it starts increasing into the chromosphere, and then in the transition region, and then it goes in, into the corona that is not shown here. Now, the EUV radiation is emitted in the transition region, and the temperature of the gas in this region, uh, of the emitting gas in this region, is around 10, 20, 30,000 Kelvin. So the, the planetary atmosphere, where the EUV radiation is absorbed, it cannot reach temperatures that are much larger than 10,000 or 20,000 Kelvin. And the reason is, is simply is simple thermodynamics, because the, the temperature of the receiving gas cannot be uh, higher than the temperature of the emitting gas. You may have noticed that uh, in the literature, uh, one of the most used ways for determining for or measuring uh, more than estimating, let's say, uh, mass loss rates is the energy limited approximation, which is uh, shown here in this equation. It is the energy limited approximation. It is an approximation and it, it balances the energy that comes from the star through the XUV um, energy input and the gravitational energy. It has several terms in here. There is pi eta, which I'm, I'm going to come in a second. Then there is the planetary radius, the effective radius that you have uh, you have seen before. The XUV radiation from the star at the distance of the planet, gravitational constant, the planetary mass, and the Roche lobe correction factor. It has several severe assumptions. Some of them are particularly severe, and we're going to uh, in a bit deeper into this. One assumption is that the atmosphere has to be hydrogen dominated. The, another assumption is that the, uh, the atmosphere needs to be in a XUV driven hydrodynamic escape regime, therefore in blow off. Uh, the XUV radiation has to be absorbed in a narrow region. Um, no additional energy has to be present in the system. Therefore, all the energy that is in the atmosphere comes from the XUV um, part of the, of the uh, radiation emitted by the star. And the atmosphere is uh, tightly bound, so genes escape is negligible. But there, there, there are other assumptions that are uh, less severe compared to, to this one. Let's come to the XUV uh, absorption radius, so, so the effective radius. Uh, often it is not possible to compute this, uh, this effective radius because it requires uh, hydrodynamic modeling particularly to compute it for a large number of planets. So often one assumes that effective radius is equal to the planetary radius. Although this works uh, uh, sometimes decently, this actually works decently well for hot Jupiters, if one goes to, to lower mass planet, this actually doesn't work anymore. And effective radius is much larger than the planetary radius, which means that if one uses, for, uh, uses the energy limited approximation to uh, estimate the mass loss rates of planets that are smaller, lighter than typical hot Jupiters, and assumes the effective radius to be equal to the planetary radius, the mass loss rate will be significantly underestimated. And then comes the heating efficiency, which is essentially the amount of the, the, the fraction of energy that is converted into heat, the fraction of XUV energy that is con converted into heat. And uh, numbers in the literature uh, range between 10 and 45 percent, also depending on the on the radiation that one takes into account. If one considers X-rays is slightly higher than EUV, uh, EUV absorption. Um, but uh, a typical value that uh, uh, would work most of the times, particularly in classical for Jupiter, is about 15%. Now let's come to boil off. Um, let's take a planet that has a certain mass radius temperature, a certain mass loss rate, let's say due to genes escape, and therefore a certain gravity. And we have an atmosphere, an hydrogen dominated atmosphere around this planet. Let's increase the temperature in the atmosphere of the planet. Mass stays the same. The radius increases because the temperature has increased, so the gas has expanded. Gravity has gone down because of the radius increase, and the, the mass loss rate has increased because gravity has gone down. Let's increase even more now the temperature. The same uh, as before happens, but this time it is even stronger, and there is even less gravity against which the temperature um, has to fight. So a stronger mass loss rate sets in and can be as strong as to make the atmosphere essentially uh, blow away hydrodynamically. Uh, boil off is important in two categories of planets. The, the, the main one is for young planets that are just released from their protoplanetary nebula. And this is because you have to imagine 
uh, a planet that is uh, newly formed and it is inside uh, the protoplanetary nebula, which helps the planet to keep the atmosphere around. It adds pressure around the planet to keep the atmosphere in. But as the, the star blows away the protoplanetary nebula, uh, the temperature of the planet also increases because more stellar radiation uh, can hit the planet. The temperature increases, the pressure around the planet that keeps the atmosphere confined decreases. And what happens is that the atmosphere can then expand because of the increased temperature and the release of pressure from the outside expands and hydrodynamically boils off. The other category of planets where this uh, is believed to happen is for hot superpaths. So these are planets that are extremely bloated, so, so they, they have a very low gravity, but, and, and are also extremely hot. And in these planets, uh, we believe that uh, uh, boil-off should also be happening. The energy-limited approximation has, uh, has problems. Uh, the, the, the application of the energy-limited approximation has problems, and this is because of the, of the assumptions that are behind the energy-limited approximation. Here, uh, I show a plot where on the x-axis, there is the gene escape parameter computed at the planetary radius and for the equilibrium temperature of the planet that we typically call the restricted gene escape parameter. And on the y-axis, there is the ratio between the energy limit, the, the, the mass loss rate computed unis, using the energy limited approximation and the mass loss rate computed for the same planet, but using a hydrodynamic code. And you see that for low lambda values, so for planets that are hot and low gravity, the energy limited approximation very significantly underestimates the actual mass loss rate. And this is because of boil off. If we have boil off, the, uh, the assumptions, uh, two of the assumptions of the energy limited approximation actually uh, break down. Similarly, but actually the opposite happens at large lambda values. And this is because at large lambda values, temperature is low, or in particular, the, the gravity of the planet is high. And if the gravity of the planet is high, it, it is less like a planet is less likely to be in, in a hydrodynamic escape regime. And therefore, uh, genes escape will start to dominate. And that's where the approximation breaks down. And that's where then the energy limited approximation starts to overestimate the actual mass loss rate. Let's now come to the non-thermal escape processes. There are a really a large, large number of non-thermal escape processes. But here I'm going to focus on two, which are the most important ones for, uh, for exoplanets. First of all, the, in general, non-thermal escape processes are the most important escape processes for solar system planets. And the typical mass loss rate for non-thermal escape processes is less than 10 to the 8 grams per second, which is, per se, less than 100 to 1,000 times uh, thermal escape processes for uh, closing exoplanets. The two uh, non-thermal escape processes that I'm going to discuss are charge exchange and sputtering. Char let's start with charge exchange. Let's have uh, uh, an hydrogen atom that comes from the planet and there is a stellar wind proton that comes and it hits or it passes nearby the, uh, the hydrogen atom from the planet. And what happens is that this proton steals the electron from the atom, from the planetary atom, and we're left with a fast atom, a fast neutral, because we have the, the proton from the stellar wind that has taken the electron from the planet. So it has composed a, an ENA, an energetic neutral atom. So this is a fast atom and a slow proton. This is considered to be uh, an escape mechanism, although there is very little that escapes, because this is mostly actually the electron that escapes. But it is extremely important to consider this process. And this is because this process is very um, very easily observable in Lyman alpha transit observations of exoplanets with uh, giant, uh, with, with hydrogen dominated atmospheres. And ignoring this process in, in the analysis of the observation can significantly overestimate mass loss rates. And now sputtering at last. So uh, sputtering works uh, particularly on, on surfaces, uh, but also on, on atmospheres. And let's imagine to have uh, a surface, a crust, um, a planetary crust, and there is stellar wind uh, that hits the crust. And these stellar wind are essentially uh, fast particles 
and the particles can penetrate inside the crust and eject some particles from the crust. And these particles that have been ejected, they can generate an exosphere around the planet. Here I show two the result from two simulations for sputtering for neutral oxygen and uh, neutral magnesium. And as you can see from the densities that come here uh, in play, we talk about exospheric density. The densities are not particularly high. And therefore, we um, sputtering can generate exospheres of metals around close-in rocky planets, as actually it happens with the moon or uh, particularly with Mercury in the solar system. And this ends the, the first part of the lecture on theory. And I'm going to come back to the uh, lecture on, uh, on observations in the next video.